married before I met him. <laughs> I'm young, I'm 25, you know, my generation, we don't get married this young. So we met actually at a bar. <laughs> so not the most conservative <laughs> Christian meeting there is out yeah. there. The way we look at how we met is that we both were not necessarily on in the right headspace, on the right path, and God put us in each other's lives. When I first met Anthony, I uh, then I did give him my number, but then I kind of ghosted him for three months yeah, so because I met him at a bar. I wasn't going <laughs> to talk to this guy. <laughs> Can't trust him. Uh, <laughs> Next time I met up with Anthony, like three months later, I told him, I said, listen, I don't date men who aren't Christian. He's like, why do you assume I'm not a Christian? You never asked me. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. I just assumed. And he's like, well, I am. Like, I think I was very career driven, I think at the time when I met uh, Jessica. And, um, and I think that naturally, I think drove us to really, okay, if this is gonna move forward, you know, what do we want in that kind of future relationship? And for me too, um, I really wanted, again, faith to be a huge part of that. And seeing that like, want and that need um, in her really inspired me, I think, to, to grow as well. I feel like the moment that we entered Chapel Street, we just felt like that community there, um, just with a group of people that um, were gathering, so that was something that really drew us. And another thing that really drawed, drawed us in as well was the fact that uh, there's a food pantry connected to it, and we are also focused on how can we feed our community. And to me, that's a very important issue because as a dietitian, I've done a lot of work with like food pantries in the past, and just that's something that I value. So from even when we had just gotten engaged, we were very intent on like how can we invest in our marriage to come, and then once we got married, we were, we wanted to invest in it. Um, we, even, we did premarital counseling with our pastor. We wanted to make sure we had a strong foundation. And then even when we were married, anything that said marriage, we were going there. Like yeah. anything related to the church, like if it said marriage in it, like we were gonna sign up, we were gonna go. If it's a conference, a talk, whatever it is, we were like 100% down to go. So the marriage retreat that we went to, it, it was wonderful. The intent of that is really just establish a strong relationship, look out for signs that may not be good signs, and uh, how can you address that and how can you grow? And it, it challenged us to ask a lot of questions and talk about a lot of things that weren't necessarily being talked about or being asked. And I think uh, one thing with some of those classes as well, and you know, you can go through that entire course, um, but all of it's, it's what you put into use, what you put into play. So I think if you take the, the items from that course, take the items from that class, and again, are able to kind of plug into that, really uh, practice what um, is reviewed each week. Um, you can really make an impact. I mean, we're such a young couple. You don't think yeah. of us as like, okay, let's pursue every marriage yeah, class we can. It's like, oh, is there something wrong? But no, it's just about investing in your marriage early on so that way you don't wait till it gets really wrong to do something about it too. Um, and I think we even told someone that we weren't that close to like, hey, like we're doing this thing in our church and they're like, I think they had asked me or him, like, are you guys okay? <laughs> like, you're doing a marriage thing? We're like, no, no, we just want to invest in our yeah. marriage now. When we're young, we're just starting out. I played sports in college, and like, if you want to be good at sports, you have to practice, right? You have to practice when you want to be good at something. So why is that any different in your relationship? Like, you have to invest in it. You have to put it in the practice so that way you can be a better player, a better spouse down the road. Well, uh, here at Chapel Street, we believe that, that marriage is something that God really cares about, that, that it's his idea, it's something that, that he's deeply invested in, and, and as you just heard, we believe it's something that those of you that are married, that you should be invested in as well. Uh, you heard that couple talk about a, a class, a workshop, a retreat that we've offered in the past, and uh, we have another one coming up in January for seven, seven weeks on Sunday afternoons. You can see the information on the screen. Uh, whether you're a newlywed or you've been at this thing for a while, we'd love for you to consider joining us for that, to invest your time in your marriage. What a great thing that we can do. Uh, let's pray as we open up God's word together. Father, we do thank you for bringing us here today. We're thankful for so much, for who you are and what you've done and what you've promised to do. And so, as we open up your word, would you speak to us and encourage us now? Amen. 
uh, today, uh, what I want to do is talk about the words that, when spoken to you, can either be really good news or really bad news, depending on the context. Uh, back when I was a kid, I loved playing football. I would come home from school every day, and I would just want nothing more than to throw the ball around. And, and every day, my mom would tell me the same thing, just wait till your dad gets home. And I'd be so excited. And, and finally, after what felt like forever, he would come home and we would go outside and I told him that I was gonna be quarterback for the Bears one day. And he told me to dream bigger. It's not that hard. <laughs> I think I was overqualified at 10. I think that's... Other times though, it wasn't so great. Uh, my brother uh, is two years older than I am and we would fight all the time. We were so competitive. Anything that we could compete about, we would. I'm in my 30s, I'm a husband and a father and I have a career and still to this day, the time that I became taller than him is like top five days of my life. Like it was this great moment for me. And oftentimes, you know, we, we knew kind of how to stay within the lines but sometimes we would go too far and, and our mom would say the same thing to us, the same message. Just wait till your dad gets home. And for some reason, we weren't as excited about that. Today, though, I wanna talk to you about that message that we see from James, the half-brother of Jesus, to the early church and to us. We've been studying this letter for a few months now, and we've been asking ourselves about the type of faith that we have been called to as followers of Jesus, a faith that is more than just intellectual acceptance, not just recognizing that there is a God out there somewhere, but a faith that works, a faith that obeys, that loves and cares and serves those around it. Last week, we made it to the end of James chapter four, and we saw him talk about the reality of our dependence on God, that as we plan our future and as we live our daily lives, we must recognize that everything we have is a gift, that life is a vapor, a mist, that everything comes from God and is to be used for God and his kingdom and his purposes. And so today, James is gonna continue that thought, and what he's gonna do is address two different groups. He's gonna talk to the wealthy and the waiting. And his message to both of these groups is the same exact thing. Dad is coming. God has seen the realities of a broken world. He knows what's going on in your life. And his power and his love and his justice are on the way, that he is coming to make all things right, so live your lives accordingly. So that's where we're going today. We're gonna spend a little time with each group. We're gonna look at James' warning for the wealthy and his wisdom for the waiting. I know we've said this a lot in this series. You've probably heard it almost every week that you've been here. Uh, James is not going to hold back. So buckle up, we've got a lot to get to today. Let's start with a warning for the wealthy. If you have a Bible, uh, James chapter five is where we're gonna be spending our time today. And we're going to start in verse one. It says this, come now you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. I told you. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasure in the last days. Look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out. And the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous who does not resist you. Happy Sunday. Now, it's important for us as we begin our study of this text that, that we understand what James is saying here and also what he's not saying. What he's not saying is that making a profit, experiencing financial success, wanting more money in your job, asking for a promotion, he's not saying that any of these on their own are inherently evil. We know lots of people who love God and had lots of wealth, but what he is doing here is giving us a warning. 
And this is something that for James, writing to this first century audience, what he's doing here is something that they would have immediately understood. He's kind of adopting the language of the Old Testament prophets. The prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, look again at verse one. We see this this language of come now you rich people, weep and wail. If you read the prophets, you see that type of language all over their writings. And what the prophets would do uh, is that they were kind of like God's spokespeople. And so when there was injustice or when there was oppression or when there was darkness, things that God did not, uh, uh, that kind of went outside of God's will, what the prophets would do would give a message and almost always the message was the same. Just wait till dad gets there. God is coming. God sees what is happening and his justice and his compassion. He is going to fix what is wrong. See, it is not simply wealth that James is speaking against. What he's doing here is actually writing primarily to those outside of the church. In the Roman Empire, this, there was a small group of people that were the very upper level, level of wealth. There were the upper class, the elites of the Roman Empire. And what many of them seemed to be doing were hoarding their wealth and using it to abuse the poor. And so he's writing this for two reasons. First, to to comfort those who were being oppressed, many of them who were inside of the church. But second, to warn the church, to say, look and see the dangers and the temptations and the things that money can do to your soul. And so today, that's what I wanna do. For us, as people with access to food, shelter, clothing, education, Healthcare, entertainment, and travel in a way that most of humanity for most of history could not even fathom. I want to show you the warning that James is giving. And in particular, the lies that money will tell us. Three of them that I want to point out to you from this text today. First, that money tells us that we will never have enough of it. I'm curious, just by a show of hands, uh, how many of you have been to one of those Brazilian steakhouses? You know, those where they give you like the green and red cards when you walk in, some of you. Uh, If you haven't, it's a wild thing to do. It's great. Uh, You walk in, they don't give you menus, they give you these cards, and the servers walk around, and they just have these like giant slabs of meat. And and you uh, put the green card on your table, and what they will do is just come, and they will keep cutting off pieces of meat, and they will not stop. And it is literally what I picture when I think of heaven. And I know my theology is not good. Jeff, he'll come back next week. He'll clean it up. Don't worry. But I can't imagine anything better. And again, if you haven't been, this is kind of the mindset that you have to have when you go there. Uh, The mindset is, I have paid a lot of money to be here, and it's time to win it back. Like, there is a salad bar. Ignore that. There are sides. You don't need to worry about those. Your wife will tell you that you don't look good and you're sweating a lot. Ignore those distractions. You are there to indulge on steak and steak alone. But this is the imagery that James uses. Look again at verses four and five. It says, look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. In other words, what these people were doing was far more than just one incredible meal. They had built their lives in a way that was, that was formed around self-indulgence. Indulgence to the point of excess. And excess to the point of sin that even when those around them were hungry and in need, they did not care. And this is the lie that money wants to tell us. That no matter how much I have, it is not enough. That there is always someone else with more or something else to buy. If I can just get to this salary or this net worth, or if I can have this amount of security, then I will be content. And it is a horizon that we will never reach. Solomon talks about this in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter five. It says that the one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. 
This is the lie that money wants to tell us, that I cannot and will not be content, that I need just a little bit more. And the Bible says that this is a meaningless and empty way to live your life. I love Paul's words about this uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter six. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This is what we must be aware of today. The first lie that money tells us, the trap that it wants us to walk into. That it's okay if I bend a rule. Everybody else is. And it's okay if I lose some of my integrity. It's not that big a deal. And it's okay if I speak badly of my coworker to make myself look a little bit better. Because it's worth it to get just a little bit more because I don't know if God will provide for me. This is lie number one. Number two, money tells us that generosity isn't an option. Verses two and three again. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasure in the last days. Uh, There's a story in the Gospels that is often referred to as the story of the rich young ruler. Some of you are familiar with that story. We're told this, that this man comes to Jesus and he is young and he's wealthy and he has power and influence. and, And he comes to Jesus and he asks him what he must do to receive eternal life. And he tells Jesus that he has kept every rule in what we call the Old Testament. Every law, he has kept it since he was a boy. And he tells Jesus, what do I have to do? What's left for me to accomplish. We see this in Mark chapter 10, Jesus' response to this man. It says, looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But he, the ruler, was dismayed by this demand and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Can you imagine that? Imagine that for just a moment, this man coming to Jesus himself, being told, this is what you must do. This is what I'm inviting you to. I'm inviting you to follow me, to be part of my kingdom. And all that he could do is grieve. Why? Because in this moment, he realized that no longer did he own his possessions, his possessions owned him. And this is why we as a church talk about generosity and we say that it is good, not just for those that we give to, but good for our own hearts as well. Because you cannot be owned by something that you are willing to give away. And generosity, is declaring that I am not owned by my stuff and that everything I have has come from God and is to be used for God and his kingdom and his purposes. And this is the type of faith that James is calling us to, a faith that will do what is necessary to keep my possessions from getting hold of my heart. Third. Money tells us that it will satisfy our heart's desires. James, some of you notice this, uh, when he's writing this, doesn't just reference the Old Testament prophets, but he also kind of references his brother Jesus as well in his uh, Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you notice this in Matthew chapter six, this language will sound familiar. In verse 19, it says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
In other words, Jesus is telling us that, that we would not store treasures up in, on earth. In other words, that we would not put our hope and establish our identity and build our lives in things that will one day end. That we will, would not put our hope in stock markets that can crash. In careers that will end in economies that are uncertain. That if you put your hope in these things, they will one day consume you and destroy you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a uh, German pastor in the 1930s and 40s. He put it this way. He says that earthly goods deceive the human heart into believing that they give it security and freedom from worry. But in truth, they are what cause anxiety. Haven't you found that to be true? That the more you have, the more you're afraid you'll lose it? That the peace and the security and the control that money promises, that all of it is just one bad day or one bad decision or one crash away. And this is the choice that in his goodness, God allows us to make. Look again at Matthew 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot love God and money. God asks you, which one will you serve? Which master do you want? Where will you store up treasures? Where will you put your hope? Where will you build your life? and things that will rot and corrode and testify against you? Or will you build your life in the treasure that waits for you in heaven? This is James' warning for the wealthy. We'll move to the second group that he addresses here as we see wisdom for the waiting. Uh, Some news that I wanted to share with you since the last time I was here at the Kessinger campus. Uh, My wife, Judy, is pregnant with our second child. Uh, We're very excited. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, We found out that we're having a girl just a couple of weeks ago, and so uh, girl dads, if you have any advice for me, feel free to send it my way. Uh, Judy has told me that having a girl is going to unravel me, and I think it's sweet that she thinks I'm still raveled in the first place. (laughs) I I have not been raveled in about five years, it's just been downhill ever since, but but Luca, our son, uh, is going to be a great big brother, he's such a good kid, but man, is he a toddler. He, he just turned two the other day and he has just the biggest emotions in the whole world and he has no idea what to do with them, just like his dad. <laughs> but he's been on uh, my mind this week as, as I've been thinking about and preparing and talking about waiting. Because waiting, as those of you that have ever met a two-year-old, is not really in his vocabulary. It's not really something that he thrives at. The other day we were watching TV on one of those streaming services and and how this one in particular works is that when an episode ends, there's a 20 second countdown until the next one starts. And 20 seconds is not that much time unless you are two years old and then it is an eternity. And I've never seen someone go from happy and sitting on the couch to wailing on the floor in 20 seconds, but he did it and I'm proud of him and he's great. (laughs) And so I tell him like, just, just, Hold on, it's just 20 seconds. Look, it's almost over. He doesn't know what I'm saying. I just do it to make myself feel better. But but that's kind of the the picture of what James is showing us here in our text. Look at James 5 in verse seven. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who, those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, 
but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no so that you won't fall under judgment. Now, I don't know if you noticed it, James in these verses uses a word four times. Did you catch what it was? Patience. Over and over, he tells us to be patient, to look to the example of the farmer who waits for the rains to grow their crops. In the Greek language, there are a few different words for patience. The one that James uses here is uh, macrothumeo, which is super fun to say. And it literally means to be long-tempered. It's the opposite of being short-tempered. It's this idea of being willing to persevere, of not losing your head in the midst of difficulty or losing your hope in the midst of darkness or losing your heart in the midst of waiting. Be patient, James says, as you wait for the Lord's return. I wonder, in a room like this, how many of us are waiting on God today? Haven't you done this? Haven't you wondered, haven't you cried out and felt this as you look at our world and you look at all the darkness and all the atrocities as you think about the violence that we've heard about and seen in Israel and in Palestine, and in Ukraine, and you think about all the other places that we haven't heard about? Haven't you felt this when you think about things a little bit closer to home? As you look at your own life, consider the pain that you've experienced, the hurtful words, the broken trust, the failed relationships, Haven't you found yourself waiting on God, waiting for healing, waiting for justice, waiting for a test result, waiting for a prodigal son or a daughter to come home? Haven't you cried out, God, won't you do something about this? Won't you fix what is broken? Are you even listening? We're all waiting for something, aren't we? And this is why I love the scriptures because here James gives us some handles to hold on to, some wisdom for our waiting. Look again at verse seven. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient, strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Now for some of us, when we read that last line, the judge stands at the door, we got a little bit uncomfortable, didn't we? This idea of the judgment of God, of God's judgment day can make us a little bit uncomfortable and for many it's something that is often misunderstood. For many people, especially those outside of the church, but maybe for us as well inside the church today, when we think of God's judgment, we think of God just unleashing anger for anger's sake. Just this uh, heavenly venting session where he brings out this cosmic scale and if we don't measure up, man, are we in trouble. And certainly we're told over and over in the Bible that God is angered by sin. We just spent 10 or 12 minutes talking about But what's clear when you examine the scriptures that what's clear is that while God's judgment isn't good news for everyone, that the justice of God is about so much more than anger. Isaiah 11 talks about this, of this this king, this judge, this Messiah that had been promised. It says that the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears, but he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips." In other words, this is the heart and the desire of the judge who stands at the door, not simply retribution, but restoration and justice and righteousness and peace. 
2 Peter chapter 3 tells us that God is patient with us. That word patient is the same one, macro thu meo, that just as we are to be patient with God, God has been patient with us. Why? Because he does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And this is what James is saying, that this is to be the source of our patience and the anchor of our hope as we wait and persevere in this life that feels so difficult sometimes. That this is what the judgment of God is. A promise that if you have put your faith in him, that he makes to you. And if you are hurting, and if you are questioning, and if you are wondering if God is still there, and if he is really listening, look again at verse four of our text today. That the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of armies, that there is nothing that has happened in your life that he does not know about. He has heard your cry. He sees you today. He knows your pain. And he loves you. And he promises that one day he will restore what is broken and free the oppressed. Dad is coming. Help is on the way. And it will not be in our timing. And it will not be in the way that we want it to happen but he will return to make things right. We are to wait by looking for God's justice. Next, we're told that we are to wait by remembering God's faithfulness. Verse 10, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You've heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. And again, what James is doing here, his original audience of Jewish Christians would have known immediately. He points us to the prophets that were persecuted and imprisoned and and mistreated because of their faith. And then he points us to Job. If you haven't read the book of Job, it's wild. Uh, Job is this man who loves God and God allows everything to be taken from his life, his family and his wealth and his health, everything is gone. And the book is about Job grappling with suffering, especially when that suffering does not have an explanation. Isn't that the hardest part? When you just don't know why something happened. And so what happens is Job and God really just have it out. And and Job goes after God's justice and his goodness. And he asks every hard question that you can ask. And God responds and he challenges his assumptions and his thinking. And in the end, even though he did not get an explanation, Job surrenders his life to God once more. And he trusts him. And he says, I will still follow you. And we're told that God restores everything that he had lost. Job 42, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. So the Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than the first. This is the point that James is making, and this is what I want to say to you. If today, this is not a hypothetical situation. If you know today what it is to suffer or to hurt, if today you are waiting on God to do something, to give you clarity, to give you healing, whatever it is for you, would you recognize this promise that has been made? that the day is coming where you will be restored of everything that you have lost. Not in this life. We know that this life will be filled with trouble. But when the old has gone and the new is here, God has promised to give you complete restoration and healing and joy and blessing beyond anything that you can experience on this earth. So for us today, as followers of Jesus, living in a messy and broken world, this is what we are to do. To wait for God's justice, to remember his faithfulness. Here's the last thing, that we are to wait by strengthening our hearts. Verse eight, you also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. 
a while back, I was sitting in my basement and Luca was sitting on the floor. He was playing and our dog was laying down right behind him and the doorbell rang. And our dog barked so loud and our son jumped so high. He was just so scared. It just all of them just like spazzed out all at once. And immediately he did two things. He started to cry and he got up and he ran right towards me and he threw himself in my arms. And it was this kind of emotional moment for me where, where I recognized that in his mind, dad means safety. And this is what James is telling us here, that waiting for God does not mean simply living passively and just letting bad things happen, but that we are to strengthen our hearts while we wait for him. And that phrase, to strengthen your heart for James, is not just about the emotional side of the heart. That's often what we think of when we use that word. For James, the heart was the very core of who you were. It was your emotions, your thoughts, your intention, your will, your desire. It was the very center of your being. And he's saying, this is what you do while you wait. Center yourself. Build your life. Establish your hope in who God is. Run to him as he moves towards you. Seek him in his word and in prayer. Surround yourself with the loving arms of community. Remember that he is on his way, that help is coming, and that he hears your cry today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your encouragement, even when it stings a little bit. Lord, today I pray for those who are waiting on you in their life with a loved one, Lord, we know that waiting can be hard and would you strengthen our hearts because of that? Would you remind us of the hope that we have in who you are? We ask this in your name, amen. Amen. As always, uh, if there's something going on in your life, something we can be praying for, our prayer team stands ready over in the glass room right out in the lobby. If you came prepared to give, you can do so on your way out or online as well. Thank you to all who do that. Would you now receive today's benediction? Would you go now in the name and the power and the hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you go secure in his love with a strengthened heart in your pursuit of him? Amen.